Welcome to the Dao Network Podcast with JC and Yan, aka your China guy. We're coming to you from Shenzhen, China. And on the show, we interview top executives, entrepreneurs, and investors who have been shaping the global business environment. Focusing on business operations and venture capital, the Dow Network is a community dedicated to educating, empowering, and connecting business practitioners and venture builders. Find out more at thedownetwork.com. T H E D A O Network.com. Hello, everyone. Today we're speaking with Jordan Burke. Jordan is the founder and CEO of Tomorrow Retail. Tomorrow Retail is a strategic consultancy that enables global retailers and brands to accelerate their digital transformation with specific focus on e-commerce channel strategy, in-store digitalization, and customer data management. Previously, he led e-commerce for Walmart in China for almost ten years. Walmart's business in China is as large as 450 stores across 180 cities and growing fast. Jordan also helped negotiate commercial terms of Walmart's four billion dollar investment in JD.com, and led Walmart JD brand collaboration post this investment. So now, without further ado, let's jump into the episode. I just want to say thank you so much, Jordan, for taking the time in your morning. I guess because you're in in New York City, and for us it's 9 p.m. here in China in Shenzhen, and it's such a pleasure to be speaking with you tonight and learn from you from the wealth of experience that you have from China and actually from Shenzhen because you spend most of your time in China in Shenzhen, if I'm not mistaken. So. It will be super exciting for me, JC, and of course our audience to learn from your experience, and that's why we're here tonight. So once again, thank you so much for tuning in. Hey, thanks for having me, Jan, JC. Always good to talk to you guys. Awesome. So people already know who you are, Jordan, from the introduction, from the bio that we shared with them, and so we don't have to get into that too much. But definitely, it would be great if you could summarize your story in China. You spent ten plus years in China. You basically build up certain parts of Walmart and even Walmart e-commerce and a lot of partnerships with companies with local players like JD and etc. So it would be great if you could just take us into your story and just give people a little bit of context what you were actually working on in China at Walmart. I was very lucky, Jan, to start my time with Walmart in China in 2008, and be there for the subsequent 11 years. It was probably the most exciting 11-year period that any major economy has seen in in recent history. When I arrived, the retail market in China was still fairly what we called emerging, underdeveloped. Not particularly advanced, and much of the learning that was occurring in China was actually brought from outside of China. Markets like the UK, the US, Canada, that changed dramatically. And by the time I finished my time with Walmart in China in 2019, it was the opposite. We were taking learnings from China and exporting them to markets around the world. My focus for most of that time was helping Walmart to transform itself from being a traditional retail operation to being a true digital-first omni-channel operation. I started with Sam's Club, and we actually led the e-commerce transformation in China with Sam's Club first, taking Sam's Club online and building a national O2O business. With Sam's Club, with Walmart, we began in 2015, and what was really exciting was the potential to partner with JD.、Uh, as you may recall, Walmart had acquired Ehao Dian, and we decided in、uh, 2016 to build an alliance with JD, where we transferred Ehao Dian to JD in return for an equity stake and a very deep strategic alliance. And from 2016 on. The transformation within the business at Walmart accelerated by an exponential factor, largely because of that partnership. 
we built a business via a platform called JD Daojia, which is JD's O to O platform in its partnership with Dada. We built multiple flagship businesses or stores on the JD platform, including cross border e commerce, and really took the way of working from a digital only concept to a really full company concept. So we digitized not only the sales occurring in the business, but also the way the company operated in China. And so now Walmart's business in China is is digital really throughout the operation. And that's, in my view, the most exciting output of the work is a much more digital first organization than when we started. I'm a big fan of Sam's Club, as you probably know, because I've posted on LinkedIn multiple times about how often, how frequently I go to, to Sam's Club and how often I order online. So you guys have done a tremendous job. I'm a very frequent customer. Uh, a follow-up question on this. Would you say that uh, Walmart, of course, given your involvement and your team's involvement, do you think that Walmart China was leading the way in China at that time in terms of the digital transformation? or that it was actually catching up with all the Chinese players that were far, far ahead of you guys? You know, I think there are two elements that Walmart led in terms of this transformation, but I think there are aspects where Walmart, we we were behind. I think we led first in the idea of a physical and digital alliance. So Walmart's partnership with JD was really the first major alliance between a digital platform, JD, and a, and a national physical retailer in Walmart. And I think that deal triggered a number of subsequent deals that we have seen in the China market between the Alibaba camp and even the Tencent camp. The idea of a digital and physical partnership now is commonplace. And I think we were one of, if not the first, to really pioneer that concept. The second was really the the transformation of the store into a fulfillment center and the use of stores to really power an e-commerce strategy. I think Walmart and Sam's Club were were very innovative, including the use of xian zhi can, the the, the front-end warehouse or, or yun can that we called it at Walmart and Sam's Club, the kind of dark store model that that has been used effectively in the market that Walmart and Sam's Club really pioneered. At the same time, of course, Alibaba and JD had been building their grocery businesses online for a number of years before we began to be aggressive in the space. So in some respects, we were catching up to what the leading platforms had already been providing. But in other ways, we were able to pioneer I would say the future model of combining physical and digital in a way that's best for customers as well as best for the economics of the business. Yeah, it makes sense. Part of your work that you do now is that you're taking these lessons learned from China and you're trying to educate players all over the world what they could do in terms of their digital transformation and new retail and stuff like that. And so we're definitely going to get into that, but Before we do that, I'm just very curious, you know, just trying to be very practical here and provide really great insight to people that are maybe thinking about bringing their companies here or building something similar to what you have built with Walmart, maybe at a smaller scale whatsoever. But, you know, what was your day to day at Walmart China when it comes to actually executing these partnerships with JD? What did it take to get to the point that you can sit at the same table with potentially the CEO or somebody very high up at JD and actually have a discussion about partnership? You know, like what does it take and uh, how did you get there? I think it starts, Jan, with understanding what's unique to China and what's universal. And then looking at sort of as an individual, how do you lead that concept? So with Walmart in China, I think it's been an important uh, journey to determine what needs to remain universal or consistent across all markets and what needs to be localized. And I would recommend that all businesses think very deliberately about this because what I found in my experience in China is those multinational businesses that succeeded were able to 
determine the elements of their DNA or the elements of their business model that needed to stay consistent and then localize or adapt everything else. So in a Walmart model, for instance, there are things that are universal. For instance, the concept of centrally buying all the merchandise that is available at stores nationwide, centrally buying it, buying it in one team in one place to be able to drive scale, efficiency, consistency. Second is self-distribution. So using your own distribution centers to be able to deliver that product to your stores is a global uh, strategy that Walmart uses and has been very effective also in China. Third is compliance and being very considerate of, of trust and making sure that you're maintaining trust in everything you do. Even if you're taking a short-term hit on performance, you're looking at the long-term trust that you have with your customer and never compromising that. So those are three things that in any market around the world, you're going to find at Walmart. But in China, everything else needs to be local. Every item that is available in a Walmart or Sam's Club is selected because it's relevant to a Chinese consumer. Every marketing message or connection with the consumer in terms of communication is tailored to what Chinese consumers respond to or expect out of a brand. The channel strategy, how you serve an omni-channel uh, approach, whether it's uh, O2O approach, B2C approach, all of that's local. And even the technology used is going to be local. So much of, of what helped our success is knowing what we're good at, knowing the strength in the DNA, but then adapting everything else to the local market. So for me personally, what that meant was knowing Walmart's heritage and strengths, but working in a Chinese way. So learning Mandarin from the time that I arrived there, living and operating within WeChat. You know, I, I, I did less email in China than I had at any point in my career at Walmart because all of my partners and most of my associates preferred WeChat as a, as a channel to engage. You know, really building deep relationships with partners, knowing each other on a personal level you know, more than just uh, a transactional level and building trust in, in that way. And also, I think in China, what, what was so necessary was being willing to be bold and take actions quickly and without having all the information, knowing there's going to be uncertainty, but willing to take that risk in order to find ways to break through. And this is the last thing I'll mention. I think Chinese partners, Chinese leaders appreciate partners and businesses that are willing to, to strive to break through, to do something new, do something never before achieved. And to do that in partnership is one of the great aspirations of, of many Chinese leaders. Jordan, I'm kind of curious, how does Walmart keep the international gene and how does Walmart adapt to local market, to Chinese market from management perspective? How does a big company like Walmart run, manage, and communicate in a totally new market? Sure, sure, JC. So I think it's first being very clear on, on the elements of the DNA or the strengths that are going to be necessary in that market. And I talked about knowing you know, what is universal and what are the things you don't compromise in how you operate versus what's flexible or what's, what's local. The, the layer on top of that, though, that is so necessary to ensure this works is a cultural lens or a cultural layer where every executive at Walmart globally has to understand the culture and the values of how Walmart operates, how it treats people, how it partners, and to be able to live and model that culture. And if you can't, your, your time at Walmart is going to be limited. And so the international strategy, including in China, is built on those two elements. First is a culture that's consistent everywhere and is expected of leaders to, to live. And second is that kind of core set of capabilities that are going to be applied in any market that the company is operating in. At the same time, 
there's a real recognition that you have to localize uh, your business. And so the example that I would talk about is the company has for many years used a philosophy called China for China, which is the idea that you know what needs to get done in the China market is going to be unique to China, just as it is in Mexico or in even Canada, other markets. And so the team is empowered and encouraged to find what, what's necessary to work in the China market. So, you know, I use the example of about 90% of the technology that's deployed in China is built or sourced for China. It's not, and I'm referring to the consumer facing technology. So whether it's the mini program or, you know, certain interfaces within the, the point of sale system in stores, you know, that most of what the customer sees and experiences is, is built for that Chinese customer rather than, you know, globally leveraged or designed in some other part of the world for use uh, in China. And that's been very effective. Through the years, have you ever faced any major competitors locally? So I, I may be biased here because of the time that I spent in China, but I would argue that China is the most competitive modern retail market among the markets that that I've certainly been exposed to. There are more competitors that are strong and and unique in their own way than than most, if not all other markets. And that's driven by the fact that in the early 2000s, it was the by far fastest growing market and expected to be the largest market, which it became. And so all international competitors invested in building businesses in China. And then you have a number of great local operators. And so, I mean, just thinking through the the subsequent, you know, the 11 years I was there, the competition was initially Tesco, Carrefour, you know, Huarun, CRV, Baorun Fa, RT Mart uh, was always a very strong competitor. Yonghui emerged as a exceptional competitor. And I think to this day, many of those, some have exited, of course, but many of the local competitors have just gotten stronger and stronger. And in their own strategic alliances with digital platforms have brought their own unique omni-channel approach. So I, I think it's as dynamic and competitive a market as there is in the world. Jordan, I have a follow-up question. I'm really intrigued by what you mentioned about culture because I'm personally a very big believer of the culture. You said that basically every single person, every single leader at Walmart has to live and breathe the culture. How did you do that? Meaning, let's say you onboarded a new leader or you hired a new leader for Walmart China. Did they actually have to go through some sort of training in the US, in the headquarter, or would you do it locally? Or how would you make sure the local leaders... Uh, within Walmart actually accept the culture or can be trained on the culture? Because I can also, from my experience, say that sometimes the culture in international businesses and local Chinese businesses is very different. And many people, many of my friends, I've seen them struggling when they, for example, changed from an international company to a local Chinese company. How did you do it in Walmart? Because I can tell from my experience with you and, and some other people that I've met from your team and even from Walmart, definitely live and breathe the culture. So how did you accomplish that, especially with the local Chinese leaders? Three things, Jan, that I think worked or have helped at Walmart and likely at a number of other businesses that make this work. First is ensuring your country leadership embodies the values and cultural way of working that you expect. So if your CEO and kind of executive committee within the country don't represent that culture and model it every day, it's nearly impossible to expect that the entire organization is going to live up to it. Second, to your question and point, yes, a lot of in the U.S. time, being indoctrinated or exposed to that culture, as well as in market time, talking about it and, and thinking about how to keep it alive and, and well. So all officers that are brought into the business locally spend time in the U.S. and other markets understanding how the Walmart culture, the four values, 
the way of working, how, how this is expected and how, how it actually works on a day-to-day basis as leaders. And then back home in China or whatever local market, it's an ongoing discussion where monthly there are meetings, whether it be town halls or other forums where culture is really the, the focus as well as just in individual discussions where, you know, folks that are new to the business, it is expected it will take time for them to understand the language, the way of behavior, the way of leadership that is is Walmart. And at the same time, you know, as a third, I think it's you've got to to instill it in the KPIs and the way of working kind of systems. And so in annual performance reviews, in ongoing performance discussions, there is nearly always an element of not only what you achieved, but how you achieved it. And that teaches associates at all levels, from a cashier in a store all the way up to a senior role uh, in a store or home office. You know, how did you approach achieving that goal becomes as much part of the conversation as what exactly did you achieve? Definitely I have to say that Walmart's culture is very very, very different from many others, at least in China. I've seen a lot of my friends coming from that ecosystem, Walmart's ecosystem, having definitely completely different way of thinking about business, about leadership than many other local leaders. So definitely have to give you a thumbs up for that, for being able to keep that up. I think this is actually one of the, one of the crucial things that you have to figure out if you want to be able to operate very effectively in the market as an international business, as a foreign business. If you don't have that taken care of, if you don't have that system in place, and if you don't know how to do that, then I think you're probably going to fail eventually. I agree. I actually have one more question relevant for people that are interested in doing something in China, doing something with Chinese companies, partners, etc. You know, we hear a lot about China and e-commerce and how big market China is and how many opportunities there are. The very practical question that I have for you, because you spend so much time on building that cross-border platform, if there is a company right now, if there is a brand somewhere in the US, in Europe or somewhere else that uh, would like to leverage what you guys have built with Walmart and the entire ecosystem that Walmart has around itself in China. Is there a possibility for a brand to just reach out to Walmart and say, hey, guys, I want to work with you. Uh, We have a great product. We have a great brand. Uh, We would like to sell in China. I'm curious because I think many people would like to ask the same question, especially after hearing this interview with you. Jan, I think think the question is probably first, what does a brand or a company need to consider before deciding to enter the China market? or how to enter the China market. And then assuming they proceed, you know, how to approach or is Walmart open? And that's an easy question. I think Walmart is absolutely always open and I'm no longer there. So I, I shouldn't represent the business directly, but from my experience, Walmart's an organization that is always interested to find new partners who are looking to sell or serve customers in the market. And so the openness is there and contacting the organization is fairly straightforward online or in stores. But back to the, the first question, which is, you know, is the China market a fit and how to enter? Yeah, absolutely. How do you decide as a brand if it makes sense? Is there any like a simple checklist that you can run through or what are some of the basic things that you should be looking at if it makes even sense for you as a brand in terms of an investment to go to China? Uh, I wish there were a simple checklist. I think there are a few major factors that a business needs to consider and decide, really. Obviously, the China market in most categories is large and historically growing and likely in the near future, again, growing. And so those are two factors that most businesses are are looking for is where do I have size and growth to be able to access? And the China market provides that in most segments. However, businesses need to realize that China, like many other markets, but maybe more so, is a market that you must commit to and invest in 
in order to see significant growth and success. So in my experience there, working with suppliers as we do, or I did hundreds of different suppliers, many already established, some looking to enter the market, I found very few instances where a company was able to successfully enter the China market without building an on-the-ground China team. So the first decision factor, I think, is are you ready to put boots on the ground and build your local China team? Because while the market is big and growing, it requires an understanding of so many aspects of serving the market that doing it from another country is typically not practical and doesn't work. So first would be, is this market one that you are ready to commit to and put people on the ground in your organization to be able to represent the business and learn the market and serve the market? The second decision factor, I think, is what is it about your offer, your product, your service, your organization that is unique and that provides something to Chinese consumers that is, or, or users that, that is not available or not available at the price you can deliver it in the market. This is a competitive market. Do not be fooled that your segment is somehow going to be so undeveloped that you're going to be the first to enter the market. It's very rare today to find white space that no one is is operating in. And even if there is, Ihan and JC, you know, very soon after, there will be many competitors that enter. So be ready for a highly competitive environment where you have to be different and know what's your strength. And then third is you have to have a partnership strategy. I would say, I think China, again, even more than most markets is one where you will likely need to rely on partners in order to realize your ambition. And so being clear on what your partnership needs are and who the best partners are, A, from a potential joint venture perspective, B, from a channel perspective. Are you going to be an Ali platform uh, business? Are you going to be JD? Are you going to be in, within the Tencent ecosystem? Where, where are you going to build your roots from a partnership standpoint? And that happens all the way down through the operation, right? From a land, if you're going to have physical space, what type of landlords are you looking to partner with through the logistics? So be, be ready for partnership to play a bigger role in your China entry than most, if not all, of your other markets. Great. Jordan, can you share about your journey after Walmart? What have you been up to and what's your interest, vision leading you to nowadays? So I decided roughly a year ago that I wanted to focus my effort on helping retailers outside of China to be able to accelerate their digital transformation. My thesis was that the Chinese market has seen a dramatic acceleration and is really three to possibly five years ahead of most other major markets in this digital retail space. And so my new business, Tomorrow Retail Consulting, is focused on helping retailers in the US, in Europe, to be able to accelerate their omni-channel business, in part by leveraging the learnings of what's helped Chinese retailers transform their businesses and survive and thrive through this omni-channel era. And so it's been an amazing year uh, because the need for this type of experience and guidance and practical knowledge on how to navigate this change is enormous. And of course, in recent months has grown dramatically with the way that customers have needed to change their behavior in the COVID crisis. And so we've been lucky to work with some of the world's leading retailers to help guide and accelerate their use of digital channels and digital innovation to grow their businesses and really future-proof their business in, in how they serve customers and operate. What are those innovations already taking place in China or in the States, but yet to be adopted to the mass market globally? 
So there's three of those that we see. The first is being able to use physical stores as e-commerce fulfillment centers at scale. And that last part's important because many retailers now, particularly in the last eight weeks, have introduced the ability for customers to order online and pick up or have delivery from a store. However, very few of them have experienced or built a business to do that at scale. And so helping retailers go from, say, 25 orders or 50 orders a day of online demand to 500 or 1,000 a day takes a a really uh, different way of looking at the store and approaching uh, that model. So that's the first area that we've been really excited to help retailers. The second is in digitizing the rest of the operation. So while e-commerce is growing and retailers are starting to adapt using e-commerce, using digital innovation throughout the rest of the customer experience is something we're helping. In China, uh, you, you may have noticed at Walmart, the use of the WeChat mini program is something that's used throughout the customer experience from accessing a shopping cart in many stores to scanning to check out, to finding product information and mapping the store. We think that's going to become a universal experience. And we're helping retailers look at how they use their app primarily to create a digital connection with the customer in every step of the journey in store. And the third is using the data that is generated from doing number one and number two very well to be able to personalize and automate the business. So with a great e-commerce business and digital throughout your offline customer experience, you now have as much, if not more data than any e-commerce company would and can use that data to create a truly personalized and automated customer experience. So we also work on what we call data operations. How do you take that data, ensure it's usable, and start to deploy it through machine learning to personalize and automate the business. You talked about data machine learning, which leads me to a question, which is where do you see the smaller startups or technologies going to disrupt or empower retail and e-commerce? The SaaS business has just exploded. So there are, are so many new applications available to retailers now that easily integrate with their legacy or or kind of core systems that have enabled big and small retailers to really adapt their businesses. So I think the SaaS market, specifically in retail, is really exciting. And a couple uh, examples that I'm seeing are, you know, consumer-facing app or or consumer-facing features that retailers are now able to access and incorporate into their apps that are low cost, very flexible, and easy to start working with. The U.S. is a a great example where there are a number of those. So basic things like feeding customers real-time updates on the status of their online order, for instance, that you you don't have to build that natively. You can access a SaaS product that can provide that to enhance your app. On the other side, the associate, the employee experience has a number of SaaS products that can help you make onboarding employees much easier, interacting with employees, personalizing the employee experience. So I think it's an exciting time for retailers because of the abundance of great SaaS product. The second area that is just exploding and is really exciting is the robotics space in retail. And there are a number of larger businesses now that are well capitalized in the space, but I think there's going to be room for innovation. And you know, this is kind of a Shenzhen opportunity given it's very hardware focused, but the amount of robotic product that will be introduced into retail in the next five years is enormous. And so I think there's a lot of space for investment and innovation there. So you know, I, I've spent a lot of time in this whole online order fulfillment space, and we've seen a dramatic increase in demand for automation in that space. So when an order comes in to a supermarket, an apparel store, you know, a home goods, a furniture store, the 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 technology used to help that store pick and prepare that order has come a long way 
And so there's robotics that are as simple as wearable technology, where the employee picking those orders can have a monitor that they're able to wear on their arm. They can have voice automation or voice guidance that they can be using to find the item, all kinds of nice enhancements that are are working. And then as the volume of those orders grows, you start to see more actual robotic automation. So AGVs that are bringing product to picker inside stores. So things that would only be in warehouses years ago are now being introduced into actual retail stores. So I think that's a big robotics space. Jordan, I want to jump in. Basically, even from my own experience, a lot of people want to learn what China is doing, what Alibaba is working on in China and see if they can take these learnings and apply them in the United States or somewhere else. From your perspective, from your experience on both sides of the table, because you have done it in China, now you're actually helping companies to take those learnings and implement them. What are some of the biggest obstacles to actually learn from a market like China, which is advanced in certain areas? I'd start by saying, I think the opportunity to learn from the China market is significant and that retailers or businesses that are not yet familiar with how their model works in China or the innovation that has been deployed in their space in China should get to know it. It, It's in most cases, three to five years ahead of Western markets, particularly. So I think there's a lot to learn there. A couple examples, I think, of what's helpful in doing that. First is just seeing your business digitized at scale. Many leaders who've not lived through that process still have a fairly limited view of what's possible in terms of digital transformation. But just seeing a retail store, for instance, that fulfills 5,000 online orders a day and understanding what kind of changes and just what that means to the business is something you wouldn't see in, say, the US or Canada. And so going there and seeing it opens your eyes and gives you a perspective. And so seeing how big is big and what's possible. And then also just how the problems have been solved. So what kind of innovation and different approaches. It, I think it it is something where there's a lot to be learned and you can take many of the concepts that you see there and adapt them uh, to your local context. Challenges, I think, you know, of course, Every market has its unique context. And so the Chinese consumer is much more flexible and early in their adoption of new technology. And so the reality is if the Chinese consumer is doing something today, it may be three years before the U.S. or Canadian customer is ready to adopt it. You know, mobile pay being a great example, it's taking more than three years, but it is likely to happen. And so you've got to be able to filter your ideas and understand the adoption curve is likely different in your home market and just be ready for that. But I don't think that means it's not going to happen. I think you need to prepare that it's likely to happen and how do you lead when it happens rather than dismissing that, oh, my customer will never use mobile pay or my customer will never use facial recognition or accept facial recognition as a feature as examples. And speaking of this, because I fully agree with you that there's a lot of lessons to be learned, but also the the very common objection that I get from people and especially people from Europe, because I come from Czech Republic, relatively small country. And so sometimes I host entrepreneurs and investors from these countries in China, and they of course come to Shenzhen, they come to Hema, they come to these places, new retail places in Shenzhen. And they're blown away, of course, because they have never seen that kind of interaction. But the objection that I get is like, we can never do this in Czech Republic because the scale is just so much smaller compared to China. When you look at it from a Shenzhen perspective, Shenzhen as a city is basically twice as big as the entire Czech Republic. So how would you answer this objection or what would you recommend to these people Because, of course, the objection is valid, but I still believe that there is things that they can learn. That's a a great question. And you're right. The scale is 
unique and is a real difference maker. I would think of it differently, though, which is I would be looking at first, what can I see in Shenzhen? What can I see in China that is reflective of the future of my customer in Czech Republic or in my market? What am I expecting will happen? And how do I see that living its life today in China? So do we think that consumers in the Czech Republic are not going to embrace similar changes, similar technology and ways of living? If we do think this is going to happen, then this gives us a picture of how to serve those emerging needs in a way that can work. So A, how do I use this to teach me about the future of the consumer? Second, how do I look at the tactics used here and adapt them? And that may be scaling them down. It may be phasing them in a way where the investment is not all front loaded. But it's not necessarily don't do this. It's how do I adapt this and make it work for my market? Because As a business, your ambition is to lead and be able to help win that future rather than be stuck trying to catch up to that future. And even a chlama or looking at a Walmart or Sam's Club that may look like because of the scale, it's just unattainable. Actually, you can strip down a lot of the capex or a lot of the investment in some of these experiences and and simplify it. Make it uh, right-sized for your customer and your market. Instead of 1,000 orders, you might start with 50. But you begin with 50 and you learn your way into scale before your competition. Makes sense. And so one last question just to close this. Where do you see the global e-commerce? after this COVID-19 pandemic, and even given the fact that some of the retailers have been catching up, you know, with what's happening in China, or at least some sort of principles taken from China, they have been already doing that even before COVID-19. But how do you see that the e-commerce is going to look like in the near future, let's say even one or two years from now, because now people are forced to think about things differently. And so we can expect that the rate of change is going to be much faster. Digitization of commerce just took a three to five year leap. And so in many markets, and I would say the US is included here, that gap between where they were 60 days ago and where they are now in terms of versus China has been closed considerably. So I think we're seeing a acceleration that like never before in the use of digital throughout commerce. The first major change that that is going to create is what I've referred to as bringing the 50-50 mindset. And so most traditional businesses have seen their digital channel e-commerce or or the way they they work in digital as being a, a secondary channel or a nice to have. And I think that changes today where 50% of their growth, their investment, their focus is going to be on e-commerce or the digital part of their business going forward. I think many businesses will start to think, how does my physical presence, my stores support my online presence? Because my online presence becomes my growth and my future. And so thinking differently versus how does my online presence drive my offline business, there's going to be a a difference in in that thinking. And then I just think it's going to be uh, a survival of the fittest acceleration. So we've seen it for the last five years, maybe even more, but now going forward, companies that can't be equally good at digital and physical just won't make it. And those that do will thrive and be able to provide experiences that that e-commerce only companies or you know digital only companies will will need to compete with. It will be a struggle for them to adapt to learn physical, just like their offline counterparts have learned digital. I think the part how physical presence is going to empower the online presence that's a major takeaway for myself. It can be applied beyond retail. 
You're right. Lastly, just curious, why Walmart picked Shenzhen as its uh, China HQ? So that decision was, wow, 1996. So I, I can't really go through the the details of the decision, but I know it's been an an exceptional partnership, if you will, between the business and and the city of Shenzhen. I mean, picking Shenzhen as your headquarters in the mid 90s was was kind of like buying stock in in Alibaba. Right. Jack Ma's seed round, you know, it, it was, there couldn't be a better city to bet on, I think, from, from my personal perspective. And I think for, you know, those folks that work in Shenzhen, I mean, it's an exceptional place in terms of the way the city has been built. I mean, it, you know, there, there's the trade off of being down in the South versus up in, in Shanghai or Beijing, where I think, Again, it's a bet. If you're if you're going to base yourself in Shenzhen, you've got to be ready to really compete to bring talent either down from other cities or from outside of the market, whether it be across from Hong Kong or other countries. But I think Shenzhen has some exceptional strengths and things to offer, particularly just the safety and way that the city's been built and managed really makes it easier to live and operate from what I learned and what I could see. And then the technology community is now on par with Shanghai in terms of the level of talent, particularly in the engineering space, I think more over in the hardware space than anything. But I think Shenzhen has been an amazing success story and has been a good base for a number of businesses. I personally enjoyed it. I think, you know, it's still a young city. And so I think what will happen over time is it'll develop its own unique Shenzhen culture. I didn't see that much in my time there yet. I think it's a, a place where people love to succeed and, and work hard. Gotcha. Jordan, thank you. Thank you for your time. Thank you, JC and Yang. Thank you, Jordan. And before we let you go, could you just please share with everyone who is listening how they can learn more about you and your work? that you do at Tomorrow Retail and with all of your clients in case somebody wants to get in touch to get you on board? How do they do that? Absolutely. So I'm Jordan Burke on LinkedIn, easy to find. And uh, look for the tomorrowretail.com site, which we'll be launching soon. And I'll be talking about that within LinkedIn and other channels. So you can find out more about how we approach digitizing retail that way. But always reach out, happy to discuss with anybody interested in, in looking at how to digitize retail. And so welcome your questions and look forward to talking more. Fantastic. Thank you, Jordan. Once again, we really appreciate your time. Stay safe and we'll definitely be in touch with you. Thanks, guys. Look forward to talking next time. That's it for this episode of the Down Network Podcast. Be sure to subscribe in your favorite podcast app so that you don't miss our next episode. If you have feedback on today's episode, email us at podcast at thedownetwork.com or find us on LinkedIn or Twitter by searching JCXU and Your China Guy. We would love to hear from you. You can also sign up for our newsletter at thedownetwork.com slash newsletter. And don't forget to give us a shout whenever you plan to visit Shenzhen. Until next time.